Welcome back, everybody, to the Compliance Forum. This is going to be my last day with you, our last day of Compliance Forum sessions. And look at this packed house. You obviously didn't party hard enough last night. How many of you were at the Compliance Cocktail Forum? I recognize some of the faces in the audience. Raise your hand. Great. We had a great time. I hope uh, the rest of you are out and enjoying yourselves. I think you all look very put together for people who've been out late last night. So thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we're going to have about three sessions here in this room. Obviously, this is our first one this morning, and it is called Machine Learning, uh, the Future of Compliance. And there's a question mark there at the end. Before I get into the actual introduction, let's have a couple of voting questions just to, you know, loosen us up, get us in the mood and find out where you all are from. All you amazing people out there in the audience, bright and early this morning, what type of institution do you work for? Is it a global financial institution, a regional bank, a local bank, a corporate, a financial services provider or consulting firm or other? Start voting now, please. Okay, I'm just going to jot these down because it will help us in our discussions a little bit later today. Uh, okay, mostly financial services and other. Okay, and next question. What are your top priorities as a bank? Is it being compliant with regulations? Is it new digital initiatives to offer new products? Is it client satisfaction or decreasing costs to increase your profitability and your margins or other? Start voting now, please. <laughs> It's interesting that number one got the top spot. I was surprised about that. Uh, client satisfaction, 6% and 50.7. Okay, so that gives us a nice starting point. So machine learning. I was, I got to admit, when I saw machine learning, I thought, what on earth is that? Uh, and then they told me, oh, it's artificial intelligence. Again, what on earth <laughs> is that? So <laughs> apparently, uh, that is gaining greater public and business awareness. Uh, the kinds of things that you use this sort of stuff for, I'm told, are self-driving cars to cancer research. Uh, and apparently, the long-awaited benefits are now starting to show some sort of reality, at least in the real world that we're living in. And uh, machine learning's core characteristics are apparently self-learning, intelligent yet consistent decision-making, and managing complexity. And apparently all of that is attractive to the compliance industry. So the types of questions we want to ask here are, first of all, what is it? What new technologies and approaches might support compliance programs in the near future? Is the regulatory environment, in fact, Act suitable for us to adopt as an industry all of these new technologies and how can the financial institutions uh, and the, in the, the companies in the financial industry, uh, the compliance side of things, fully leverage the potential benefits of machine learning. So joining us to discuss all of this, and I'm hoping to clarify uh, all of us who, I'm sure there are lots of technology people in the audience, but I'm sure there are many people like me that don't understand anything like technology. I haven't even set up Apple TV yet, so that's the base you need to work from. Uh, so, um, you know, please uh, help us out to understand all of this. Let's introduce you to them. First next to me is Dan, Dan Adamson. He's the founder and CEO of Outside Intelligence. Next to him is Nick. Nick Ryman Tubb. He is the CEO of the Institute of Financial Innovation in Transactions and Security. And next to him is Anthony. Anthony Fennick is the global head of AML at City. So I'm going to ask you, Dan and Nick, first of all, tell us what you, because I know everybody is familiar with City. What, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what do you guys do? What does your company do? And what kind of things in the real world uh, that your company does will affect our lives. Uh, well, th thank you, Kavita, and, and uh, thank you, uh, Cybos, for having us here. 
Uh, Outside IQ uh, created a cognitive computing platform that's very focused. Uh, it, it is trainable as a researcher. And as such, uh, AML investigators, uh, fin crime experts have gone and trained this platform to create uh, an automated due diligence system that can essentially uh, learn to think and act much like an investigator would when assembling a due diligence report. Um, this is using AI technologies, including machine learning, and we'll t- talk about what that means today, I think, a little more. But um, we are very focused on creating auditable reports uh, that have the strengths of machine learning built in so they can, unlike an investigator, not get tired. Right? They are reproducible. They have an audit trail. Um, they can go deeper than an investigator without, uh, w- with consistency. And... These reports are being used today. Uh, We launched DDIQ as a product last March. They're being used by over 60 financial institutions now, including several leading global banks. Um, And uh, we have seen huge benefits in terms of ROI. Okay. All right. Let's get to you, Nick. Sure. Good morning, Geneva. (laughs) (laughs) I've always wanted to say that on stage. Um, Well, possibly not the Geneva bit. New York might be there. <laughs> That's right. We get it. <laughs> um, the Fitz Institute is a, a new institute, although I'm somewhat rather older in machine mm-hmm. learning, um, st- having started something back in the mid-1980s. Um, what we're about, we're a, a non-profit organization that's committed to using machine learning uh, to help reduce crime and that crime also includes financial fraud. And what we do is bring together best practice, the best types of machine learning, uh, collaborations within the industry, uh, and also with the intelligence and uh, the intelligence community. Uh, we're strongly linked into academia, so we have uh, new research programs at the University of Surrey in the UK, which is one of the few universities linked itself into uh, cyber research and so on. Um, so we're not a, a research institute. We provide practical solutions. We have uh, software solutions in this area um, for our members, uh, uh, but we sort of promote the use of new types of machine learning. Okay, I'm going to get to Anthony in a second about how a bank like City is using any of this stuff. But before, I think, try and break it down for us. What is it? What is machine learning? For example, I got up this morning, I left my hotel room. Have I been affected by machine learning since I got here on the stage? You know, what are the kinds of things that we see in our daily lives that machine learning has actually been happening? Uh, and uh, after that, then tell me how banks are using this. So let's start with, with you. Uh, I, I think, you know, to give a somewhat just very brief academic answer, machine learning uh, to me, is, is a subset of AI. It's a branch of AI that really has had some initial commercialization success. And so it's a set of algorithms um, that are good at certain things. And uh, that would include things like classifiers or recommendation engines. Uh, so th- this is a small branch. It, it has been largely influenced by the big data movement, on the one hand, trying to ch- you know, go through and process all of this data. Uh, that, that's very focused and has had some commercialization success. So, so yes, you probably have been impacted mm-hmm. uh, if you went uh, and asked Siri for, for directions on how to get here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Siri, Siri uh, one of the things, you know, is a very, very simple combination of some of these technologies uh, backed by a rules-based system. So it has NLP on the front end to understand what you're asking it and on the back end, some rules on how to respond. And, and, and that, that's a very simple early example, but from there, it, it starts to expand and, and has grown to encompass other AI technologies. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, sort of machine learning has actually been around for quite some time, and it's, it's in, in many areas that you might not think. So in your hotel room, you might have an air conditioner, and in fact, uh, some of the controls in the air conditioner, rather than being programmed uh, by a programmer back in Japan, um, in fact, what they've done is they have uh, analysed inputs from different sensors, humidity, temperature, and so on, and then had humans say whether they feel comfortable or not, and 
then allow the machine to make adjustments to the compressor and other parts in the air conditioner to achieve that aim. So some expert hasn't sat down and said, this is what you should do. Mm. The machine has learnt a connection between comfort, Mm -hmm. which is a bit of a vague concept, the same as fraud is a vague concept. In in fact, we can't specifically say every single element that leads to it. Mm -hmm. So machine learning is about uh, allowing the machine to detect or notice patterns. They may be unusual, they may be common, they may be frequent or infrequent, Mm -hmm. but they're not programmed. Someone hasn't sat down and had to analyse all that data Mm -hmm. to come to a fixed decision. We allow the machine to come to the decision. Okay. Uh, Anthony, uh, you're the the banking guy (laughs) up here. Uh, So you're a brave guy uh, being up here with these two technologists. Uh, Tell us how you were using this sort of technology or starting to think about using this sort of technology to catch the bad guys. Yeah, okay. Um, I think it, in reality it's still in, in its infancy within the banks. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, probably the, the most advanced part of the business would be in the card space and fraud and so forth. But, uh, you know, the real, um, the real utility, I think, for this will come in, in, in the much larger businesses, the cash, mm-hmm. cash especially, and the, and the AML monitoring that we do, um, obviously, across our cash business. Uh, you know, some of the the early sort of re- the early dance has started, I think, in the space for us especially. But some of the key things is, uh, and especially for a bank like us, is the sheer size of data sets that we have that may come from a multitude of different systems. Uh, we have, you know, people in centres all around the world, uh, clustered in hubs and so forth who uh, you know, are operating in, under slightly different circumstances and so forth. So getting all that together mm-hmm. under a single platform uh, is a difficult task. So uh, as I said, it's, for us, it's something that we definitely want to uh, do something with because, especially in the current uh, sort of low-interest environment, the cost of compliance is, uh, is very large and mm-hmm. uh, we, need to, we need to be more efficient with what we, what we have. Okay. You mentioned, Dan, that this was the 60 institutions are yes. now currently using some of your technologies. Tell us a little bit about those technologies, uh, who's using it, and what kind of cost has that saved them? Uh, DDIQ is quite flexible and, and tunable and trainable, to, to Nick's point. Um, DDIQ. This is, yes, that. DDIQ. Is that DDIQ? Uh, it stands for due diligence IQ, and mm-hmm. that's the, the machine learning component to this. Uh, it's being used today by banks from anything from uh, their investigations team, so sort of high-end investigations, uh, EDD, through to uh, you know, fairly complex onboardings, mm-hmm. KYC at the onboarding stage, mm-hmm. uh, very simple onboardings as well, uh, through to anything in between. So hit clearing is another example. And, and one of the things that, that, that this technology is great at, as Nick mentioned, um, you know, there's so much data out there. Uh, a, a lot of time is being spent on false positives. Mm-hmm. So anything you can do to, to rip out uh, those false positives and clear them automatically mm-hmm. is something then that, that your teams don't have to touch. And, and that's really a strength of, of some of this technology is that, that pattern recognition, that, that classifier that allows you to discard mm-hmm. a, a lot and focus on, on really the, tr- the true risky, risky uh, events and, and potential risks out there. Nick? Yeah. Um, One of the things that's uh, perhaps a concern with machine learning, and particularly with technologies such as uh, neural networks you may have heard of, or deep learning neural networks and so on, these are technologies that you can uh, immerse, if you like, in a sea of data and allow them to uh, come up with alerts to say this particular transaction looks unusual or this particular transaction has characteristics that you ought to go away and investigate. One of the issues has been that, uh, that they can't explain the reason why. Mm-hmm. And so what we've, as an institute, have been working on some really leading-edge stuff, saying, can we actually open up what has been seen as a black-box technology uh, to get it to explain its reasons? In other words, work with human investigators to say the reason why this particular transaction uh, or this particular company that you're reviewing looks unusual is this. And in fact, then learn from the human investigator. Human investigators got 20 years of experience 
experience, probably, um, that you're paying for. So um, if he can then look at that information and say, well, it's interesting, but you're wrong. Actually, this is, this is not a, a, an issue. You know, I can see that this is a, a proper business that we want to do deal. And we were talking earlier, um, your best customer looks, in fact, very similar to the best criminal. And the difference between the two is a very thin line because, of course, criminals are trying to look. They don't turn up in, uh, in masks, uh, ski masks anymore with a gun. Um, they, in fact, turn up in a very nice suit with a very good Facebook profile showing that they're uh, upright citizens and so on. So actually distinguishing the two is very tricky. Mm-hmm. And while a machine can perhaps filter out lots... Mm-hmm. Um, it's the human that's going to ultimately make that decision. And so we need tools that work with the individual, but learn from that individual. If we now capture that knowledge, that person is imparted back into the machine, your machine is actually adapting. And the problem that we're facing with crime is it's not stationary. Too many people have looked at that the problem is being stationary, mm. but everything changes. Yeah. What was a common way of perpetrating a particular type of fraud or crime uh, this year will be different next year as technology moves. We're all seeing the way payments are undertaken are constantly changing mm. with uh, all sorts of new electronics methods. Yeah. So also our detection systems have to be able to adapt at the yeah. same rate. Yeah. Um, okay. so. I'm just going to have a short note to my room producer at the back because I know you've been lo- rapidly texting in lots of questions and comments. Sadly, this machine has gone to sleep for a little while. So while uh, they sort that out, keep texting in your comments and stuff. I'm going to get back to Anthony and, and ask him, what is the appetite from the C-suite about having machines come in and play a greater, thank you, a greater and greater role in all of this? So is there still a lot of mistrust that we still need to be looking at things uh, and we don't really want to let go of that control. It's a mixture of the two, I think, to mm. be honest. Um, listen, anything that's going to save us money, this is sweet love. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's, there is obviously the element of control. Um, you know, I was having a discussion actually yesterday talking about sanctions uh, systems and so forth and there are a lot of providers out there that, that mm. can supply that as a, as a resource to you. But a lot of the, obviously, the banks of sort of our side, sides have built our own sanction screening platforms. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very unlikely that we would hand that over to somebody else, just because if you get sanctions wrong, it's pretty catastrophic. So um, I don't think we will necessarily hand over the keys uh, <laughs> to somebody else, but I think what we are very interested in, and, and you know, I think one of the most depressing things for us is compliance is when you actually go to some of these large uh, data centres and you see the sort of cream of uh, Warsaw University, um, you know, knocking their heads against uh, transaction monitoring alerts, <laughs> of which, you know, 90% are false positives. Um, it's very... It's, it's, we all know that we need to do better in this space, but it's, it's more, I think, the technology is finally mm-hmm. catching up with us. So I think for, for our, the, the senior management at City, it's, it's very much... I think if we in the compliance chain can present a, uh, uh, an appropriate case to them, mm-hmm. you know, they're going to... What, what sort of things would you say to them to present that? What kind of things you ask them to consider when you present that case to them? Because I'm, yeah. uh, I'm conscious of the fact that a lot of people want to go and do the same thing with their C-suite. So yeah. it'd be interesting to get, you know, your learning curve, as it were. Well, we haven't done it yet, yeah. to be honest. Uh, as I said, we're still in that sort of uh, infancy for, uh, for the main bulk of cash monitoring and, mm. and all the other pieces. But I think it's, 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 it's proving uh, its worth, really. I mm-hmm. think they want to see, uh, obviously, that we're much more efficient mm-hmm. with the way that we process data and also how we investigate. Um, but also uh, effective so, as well. Yeah, it's got to be effective. Yeah. And, and to be honest, it, it, to be more effective than our current state wouldn't mm. be difficult. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that argument is, is pretty good. But what we would like to see is a very good improvement mm. uh, to the process. I think one of the other, the key really is, is not really the C-suite we need to worry about. It's the uh, presentation to the regulators. I think in compliance especially, mm. we're going through a big change between, I, I would sort of call it old monitoring, mm-hmm. which is sort of threshold-based, mm. scenario-based uh, transaction monitoring, uh, produces a ton of um, uh, false positives. And I think we're at that stage where the uh, community and compliance are saying, look, we've got to do something better than this because the 
the current standard isn't isn't doing what we really want it to. So on, I think I think the vote that we had earlier today. Hope this machine doesn't go now. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the vote that we had. It's still working. Uh, the vote that we had earlier today. I, so, Leah, if you can pop up the results to question number two that we had. I think that was very illuminating. You know, as a bank, most people I think was would be surprised that decreasing cost, increased profitability, and margins came in at 15.7 percent. You only. 23%, uh, 24% of you worried about client satisfaction, but everybody's worried about being compliant with uh, regulation. I voted for three, so uh, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, well, we'll yeah. make sure we tell your boss that. <laughs> yeah. uh, some of the questions and comments coming through, uh, and I'm going to read some of them out, and then if you when you take the one you want to do, just sort of uh, let everybody know which, which one that you plan to do. So somebody asking, explain what NLP is. Is it natural language processing? Uh, with machine learning comes self-modifying systems. This is counter to stable systems tried for today. Will it even be allowed? Uh, I think we answered this one, to be quite honest. Do you see machine learning replacing the human element of remediating first-level alerts as well as the EDD work? Somebody asking Dan to go in a little bit more about how what he does uh, helps uh, uh, KYC. Uh, so let's start with some of those first. Which one do you want to take? I'll, I'll take a, a first stab at a, at a few of those. Okay. Uh, NLP does stand for natural language processing. Um, that's the ability to understand the human language, either written or spoken. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, a, it's a difficult field, particularly in compliance, because a lot of compliance issues are global in nature. Uh, so uh, DDIQ now supports 18 languages, uh, but that's with, uh, with much effort, mm -hmm. right? And we have 30 more on the way, mm -hmm. but it's really a global problem to understand uh, all of those regional nuances. Uh, it, it's necessary to get into those weeds there. Mm -hmm. uh, around uh, you know, KYC, uh, it depends on the type of onboarding. Uh, for example, uh, KYC, know your, know your client or know your customer. Uh, often that involves some level of due diligence. I think it's also a, a moving target, much to Anthony's point, uh, around working with the regulators. Mm -hmm. uh, you as banks, I, I am sympathetic for, you have all of these geographies that you have to worry about, all with different regulators, all moving the dial in different directions. Uh, generally not for the easier, <laughs> but the watermark keeps rising. Um, so depending on your risk, uh, the type of client that you're onboarding, uh, very often it's not enough to just do a simple watch list screen anymore. It's not a get out of jail free card to, to say that somebody's not on a watch list. It's a critical function, but it's not enough. And so often you have teams of, and, and when you look at, at the answers there to question number two, Right. If you look at the actual bank spends, uh, JP Morgan now has over 10,000 folks in, in compliance. Uh, HSBC, I think, hit that threshold. I don't know how many city has, Anthony, <laughs> under you. But uh, uh, you know, these have been knee-jerk reactions to these regulatory changes, and it's necessary to, to arm up with, with people to, to solve these problems first. But you have these corresponding huge spends Right? And, and it's really not sustainable to businesses. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, how do you automate that in different areas where you've built up these armies of people to do that? And, and one of these functions is in KYC, where you might be onboarding today with a combination of, of watch list sanction screening mm -hmm. on the one hand and some level of due diligence looking through Google's on the other. We, we get that all the time, where, yeah. where it's a very error-prone process. And I, I heard the term, you know, six-eyed review. And I said, what, what is that? Yeah. Right, and that's because that's you right. built up technology these technology person asking what is that? that makes <laughs> right, this, this is, or four-eyed reviews. These are error-prone processes that you have had to replicate or repeat because of those error rates to make sure that you're catching things. Mm -hmm. And you've built up armies of people necessarily to do that, but is there a better way? Can you take a look at those real big spend items? And on the one hand, you have to be less error-prone. You have to do better, right? But can you also do that more efficiently? and in a more timely manner. Uh, so if you can onboard a client faster because you collapse the, the KYC portion from, from a week to a day, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a huge benefit to your, to, on your client sat level too. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I think I answered maybe two of those. But. Good. A plus. <laughs> I don't even remember them now. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Nick. <laughs> well, what I, one, one thing I was going to add in there is to do with the... You need some machine uh, learning. Yeah, well, no, the, the, the project side. Um, all too often I've seen organisations look at a whole range of what might be seen as latest fad technologies mm. and then rush headlong, probably as a push by vendors into some enormous project um, that takes a lot longer than you thought, costs more than you thought, and delivers mm. much less than you thought. Do you work so, silly? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so as a small word of caution, I would say that w the, the way to look at machine learning is, is to find an area or, uh, where automation would make a, a, a noticeable, significant difference. Okay. That the that getting the data to the machine isn't an enormous project in itself so that we can actually deploy something which then earns credentials within the organization which then allows you to expand the reach of that project into other areas to do more. So for you, Anthony, what area would that be that first one for people, the low-hanging fruit, as it were, to sort of prove my success to my CEO so I still keep my job, everybody thinks I'm great, and <laughs> if I want, I could, you know, move on to another company and make a lot more money. Well, uh, <laughs> You're off, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Funny on you. Um, I think, you know, the, 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 the key piece for us would be the cash monitoring of our, of our corporate and, and FI clients, so correspondent banking and in, in the general monitoring in that space because, <clears throat> you know, the amount of people that we have, and, and in essence, when I hear these guys speaking, what we do to fill that <clears throat> lack of intelligent computing, we use humans uh, as computers, in effect. Uh, and as, as we all know, humans aren't very good uh, in that position. So for me, I think initially would be choosing a small subset of the cash monitoring business, proving the, the worth of the, the process. I also think in, comply, in our monitoring, we're going to move away from single uh, machines for everything in mm -hmm. the business, and it'll be much more targeted to particular risks that a different type of business uh, mm -hmm. uh, throws up. So correspondent banking in Nigeria is different from correspondent banking in the Middle East, say, for mm -hmm. example, and I think it's going to be much more. So a useful thing, and I think, in this space would be looking at uh, a very s small pathway, improving the model and then expanding out. We always, uh, I like to say at Citigroup, is that, you know, you don't try and eat the cake all at once because mm -hmm. you just get a bad uh, dose of indigestion and <laughs> will lead you to a very expensive failure uh, in the end. So it's small steps. Mm -hmm. I think this is uh, this is something that will take time, but um, it's, the signs are looking good. Okay, uh, some of the other comments coming through. The, someone saying, you know, the vote that we had, uh, which shows that most people are worried about uh, compliance regulations, says that uh, banks have definitely lost the plot. Delivery of products and services must be the priority to legitimate customers. Uh, so good on you, Anthony, voting for three. Um, you mentioned uh, transaction monitoring. How about clearing sanctions alerts, or is that too risky? I think we sort of touched on that. Um, is machine learning at a sufficient maturity level yet? If learning takes too much time, there is no business case yet. Somebody said that machine learning really depends uh, on high-quality, complete, and up-to-date data data. Banks are not very good at this. How do you address this challenge? I think that's a great question. Let's, let's start with, with uh, you, Nick. Uh, data is probably the single biggest challenge of every single project mm -hmm. I've been involved in mm -hmm. since the 90s. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, getting at the data, mm -hmm. which these days... Uh, whenever I mention that I would quite like access to certain data, everyone clusters in a room and shakes their heads and gets terribly sweaty. Um, it gets worse because what I actually want to do is join this piece of data with that piece of data from two different areas of the bank of which that data should never So give us some, some sort of best practice. In an ideal world, mm -hmm. what would be the data Nick needs in order to help a bank really do what it wants to do? Well, you need a mixture of the customer side data and transactional data from mm -hmm. across the bank, from across the organisation, if you could do it, mm -hmm. and if your infrastructure now moving perhaps towards 
the sort of big data movement mm -hmm. would be that you would get all of it together as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And the machine learning doesn't need perfect data, by the way. You can have missing records, you can have corrupt data, mm -hmm. you, because we know that exists. Mm -hmm. And because, to some extent, what we try to do with machine learning is mimic some of the ways that we're able to, uh, you can recognize my voice, see this pattern, and so on. You've not been told explicitly how to do that. Machine learning does much the same. So if a piece of information is missing, it, that piece of information may not be crucial in the decision it was going to make any rate. Mm -hmm. And so you can have missing data, and you can have data with wrong values in and so on. Mm -hmm. But the crucial thing is how is getting that data in a single place. Mm -hmm. And that often is quite a project in itself in, in many organizations. Mm -hmm. how, how does it how is it for you at City? Is that a project in itself for you? Everything's a project. Even, uh, <laughs> turning a computer on is a project. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it's a massive problem. I think, especially with a, a, a bank like ours, um, and, and one of the key things that we, we would love from the, um, uh, you know, this side of the house is really the corporate memory. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if anyone else in the audience, but our corporate memory is pretty much our email. <laughs> uh, and uh, probably our, you know, what we have inside from, you know, in our brains, really. And when, when someone walks out the door, mm -hmm. we tend to lose all that corporate memory with them as, as they do that. And it's a little bit the same with data. Um, we have data all over the place. And we're not, sometimes we're not even sure if anyone knows where all the data is. Yeah. Uh, and locating the right people. Um, and then when you take a look at the data, it's in such a horrible state. Uh, uh, that uh, it's, a, it's a project in itself to get it into some sort of you know, format to be able to hand over to the technology guys. And then you run into data privacy. Mm. Uh, and then all the other things that you know, come, come about. Um, but I think the, the, the key problem for us currently is the fact that for us to switch over to a, to a new platform or a new process, we can't switch the old one off. Mm -hmm. So it's the idea that, you, in essence, you have to run two programs at once. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we're not resourced or capable necessarily to do that in a very quick way. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the key things I think we're now exploring with the regulators, and it was interesting, I, I heard a speech from the, uh, uh, the FCA um, enforcement uh, head the other day. We were saying, look, you know, um, we understand that you want to make changes. And you should feel confident to come to us and say, look, we're going to start tinkering with our process, which is very positive uh, uh, outcome, I think, from the regulator. But as I said, it's, it's, it's difficult to run those two mm -hmm. concurrently. Sure. I, uh, I'd love to just touch on sure. the, the data problem because it is huge. And um, DDIQ is very focused on external data. Uh, it can bring in internal data. But our, our assumption is actually purely the reverse is that you can't trust anything out there. <laughs> so it starts with a skeptical mm. mindset and it brings all of that data in and it looks for commonality and it tries to triangulate mm. and, and weed out those, those patterns. Uh, and, and trustworthiness is the other part where um, for it to produce a report or a result at the end of the day, uh, the old school machine learning technologies that you might think of, the neural nets that can't be explained, right? Those really don't work in this space. So whatever you do <coughs> as you are uh, investigating these technologies, make sure that you are using something that is open book, that can explain itself. So that wh when you're dealing not just with yourselves, but with the regulators, uh, you have something to fall back on that has an explanation. And it absolutely at that point can be trusted. It can be audited. It can be sampled. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when you compare it to human error rates, they can be much, much lower. Right? What, what are the risks of using AI machine learning? Mm. <laughs> From the bank's perspective, yeah. do you want to start? It's, it's, with anything, it's, it's um, one of the, there's two things. In banks, we, we, we rely on technology a little bit too much. You know, I think in the, in the past, we've sort of said, you know, someone's come to talk to us about our monitoring system. We say, oh, it's that black box in the corner over there. <laughs> no one has any idea what goes on in the box, but, um, you know, evidently that's, and that's the program. And I think that is the problem here, is the idea that you can't rely on it too much. And I, I go back to Nick's point of saying that whatever we do, the human element, especially, if, you know, financial crime is a, is a human uh, enterprise. Yeah. Uh, and we must ensure that we keep 
uh, well-trained, uh, uh, experienced uh, investigators working with technology. Mm -hmm. If it's the box in the corner, then you're, you're in yeah. trouble. Yeah. Um, Dan, somebody asking, have you ever actually replaced human investigators the, in the whole AML investigation? Oh, great question. And that's a loaded question. We so, have a very small uh, audience <laughs> here. Don't sound so surprised. I would say a absolutely not. <laughs> uh, we, we do do uh, exception-based processing, but ultimately our goal is to uh, rip out the obvious mm -hmm. stuff, uh, present the nuances, you know, you know, there's something that we will catch absolutely 100% of the time. Uh, Dan committed fraud as a s statement there. We'll flag that. Uh, and, and it will learn about the subject, make sure that's the right Dan. You know, it might be a different Dan. There's a tax evader Dan and there's a seeing eye dog fraud committing Dan. Those are different Dans. Those aren't me. And it will d dispel those and explain why. But then, then there might be an ambiguous statement such as Dan... Dan was aware of misrepresentative statements made to the board on a given date. Well, is that fraud or not, right? That's very blurry and very difficult for a machine to, to make that assessment. We always present that, and it's always a decision tool at that point uh, to, for an investigator to decide whether to escalate that or, or, or not, right? So it's not our goal to replace humans. Our goal is to uh, let them focus on what they're trained to do best, which is make that decision, as opposed to spend the two days to consolidate all that research into one place. Sure. I mean, great comments coming through. One person saying, if many banks run compliance on the same customer, why not share results in a central repository with confidence rates? Mm -hmm. You know, like how, I don't know if any of you live in the UK, and you're trying to look for a plumber, which is like... <laughs> I can't tell you, finding gold dust mm -hmm. in London uh, mm -hmm. that will not charge you the earth. If I had to do it all over again, I'd be a plumber, that's for sure. Um, and we have these sort of rated uh, online... Very popular. <laughs> <laughs> you have this sort of view where you can rate different plumbers. I mean, that's really what he's talking about or she's talking about, set a confidence rates in a central repository so banks don't have to keep doing the same thing. Or do we run up against more risk, the fact that we've only checked them once and everybody thinks the same thing? What's your view? Well, one of the things we're trying to do at the Institute is uh, promote collaboration. Um, criminals collaborate. Mm -hmm. They talk to each other, they communicate, mm -hmm. they share data, mm -hmm. uh, they share the method, uh, they share lists of those organisations through which it's easier to commit fraud than others. Mm -hmm. Um, and they do this all the time, and the policing and enforcement community know this, mm -hmm. yet our systems sit in silos. Mm -hmm. They're separate with their own little data, and you can only see a part of the picture very often, mm -hmm. which is extremely frustrating when you can just see that, mm -hmm. and if only you had this additional information. So as a group, and this has happened in the telecoms industry, I'm partly from there, mm -hmm. uh, where they do share data, um, is that you have to decide, is AML a competitive advantage to your organisation or not? Mm -hmm. If it's not, if it's not something you think, well, if we're more efficient at this, we'll pass it on to Citibank and they'll mm -hmm. take the... Uh, if it's not a competitive advantage, then collaboration makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with collaboration is, of course, we need the regulators to agree about how and what sort of data is allowed to be shared, where, how it is obfuscated or otherwise, how it's kept... Uh, confidential. If it all goes into one place, then that's a very interesting place for people to try to get into, and so it goes on. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. implications, mm -hmm. but I can certainly see from the investigation and enforcement side that criminals don't care about any of that. Mm -hmm. They don't care whether you, your bank talks to this one, yet the transaction itself will, throw, will flow globally yeah. through multiple systems. So if you only see one tiny bit of the picture, even if I've got HAL 9000 level AI sat there making amazing decisions, if it only sees that, that's the only part it can make a decision on. Mm -hmm. So we do need to collaborate. Sure. Anthony, do you think we can get to a point where we have this central depository? One day, yeah. I think. Uh, I think, it's <laughs> def again, um, uh, the, the cost of running all these separate systems has become so... Uh, large. Let's, let's that, elaborate on that a little bit yeah. as well, because somebody asking as well, what is the cost of machine learning? How much investment is required? How long does it take? And what is the payback period? And compare and contrast that with what you're doing at the moment. Mm. You're saying it's, it's high. I, I don't know the answer to the first uh, question. <laughs> we'll ask these guys. Um, but 
it's so clunky and so uh, manual and and uh, and the you know the the success rates that we're seeing for especially on monitoring platforms uh, it wouldn't be difficult to make uh, you know huge leaps in in productivity and also in cost savings and so forth I think what's happened obviously over the last explosion in compliance if you want to call that in the last five years all the banks have rushed in there and, and deployed you know uh, thousands of people doing pretty manual tasks because they had to you know we had a regulatory requirement you know Citigroup's got three consent orders so we have to uh, meet those requirements and I think now that that has you know that we've stopped the the rot so to speak yeah. we need to think about where we've deployed resources uh, or over engineered etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think over the next sort of five to ten years we'll see that change in, in the way we do things. Mm -hmm. Let's start with you guys. I want to get back to this question. What is the cost? I'm now sitting in the audience. I'm thinking, great, 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 great. I'm going to go back next week and I'm going to present this kind of business case. Where do I even start? How much is this stuff going to cost me? Um, how much investment? How long can I say when I present my business case? Well, you know, you're going to get this benefit. You'll see pay, this set of payback in this period. Uh. I mean, you do this uh, yeah. so, 60 so, institutions. So, so tell us we, we started a year and a half ago, and, and we, we have about 60 institutions that are paid clients already. So mm -hmm. we have a pretty streamlined piloting process that I think works, that, that uh, we'll work with banks, you know, obviously with their piloting process. But it is as simple as, as turning it on the next day and getting, getting real value at the investigations. And then the more, the more plugged in that you make it, obviously there's an IT cost So what to kind that. of investment are they making uh, in these banks? Give me know, some money. Give me some figures. Oh, it, it can be very, very small scale. Uh, you know, they, these can be uh, SaaS solutions that are easy to adopt, that uh, you, know, you can put on your credit card on a monthly basis mm -hmm. at the extreme. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the other end, uh, we're working hard to, to, with the right integration points, with the right... right uh, uh, workflow systems to integrate uh, so that even that will become become very doable in the near so, future. So is this something, Dan, you're doing a politician's answer for me, so we're looking no. at from thousands uh, maybe uh, for, a, for a bank to, to millions or to hundreds of thousands, and is this something that they can build, you know, I'll take this bit first because this is really my low-hanging fruit and then I'll add this bit. Oh, and, uh, and we actually recommend that. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the big bang approaches fail, mm. to, to everyone's point. They do have to be controlled so we can start with you know your your edd investigations mm -hmm. group and it can be a thousand dollars type of uh, engagement for mm -hmm. for on a monthly commitment so very very easy simple okay. uh through to uh higher volume mm -hmm. uh things like hit clearing where you know your volumes and uh, you know, you can calculate your ROI. That that really needs a piloting process. Okay, so the KPIs that they're looking at are what time? T time efficiency for sure. Uh, uh, productivity gains. Uh, ultimately, it has to work better than the mm -hmm. current processes, mm -hmm. right? So if you can collapse those four-eyed reviews or six-eyed reviews into, mm -hmm. t I guess you know, two eyes, that, that's that's great. And and if you can pass through a lot of that. Uh, and only focus on the 5% mm -hmm. uh, of that, th then that's a huge ROI that you should be able to very simply then mm -hmm. calculate on, on your gains for. Nick, you want to come back? Yeah, I think one of the, the costs, uh, and certainly we've seen it within larger uh, banking organizations, is actually getting time and space within IT. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, your IT group typically already has a list that's going to take them 18 months to process. And then we turn up and say, hey, hang on a minute, we now want to put a, a new big server box in there and it's going to have some machine learning software on that you know nothing about, that you've somehow got to quality control and will now have to go through your extremely slow quality control process. Mm -hmm. Oh, and they're telling us it'd take 18 months. So there's a sort of practical level of trying to deploy solutions inside a large organization with all the IT sat there. So what we sometimes see is the ability to do the black box in the corner, a small application, a small project on the side. It's sort of not in the mainstream. It's not real time. It's not in the mission critical part mm -hmm. so that if it fails... Mm -hmm. um, terrible things happen. Mm -hmm. And so we try to pick those initial projects, like we were saying, say an investigator's tool. Oh. So if a spreadsheet went wrong on someone's 
laptop or on their you know, it, it wouldn't be a disaster mm-hmm. well unless you're just doing the figures for the board the night before <laughs> but generally not a disaster yeah. uh, and so we try to sort of get a, a smaller initial system in place and as you say the cost isn't always just pure monetary cost it's training people mm-hmm. to use the system mm-hmm. um, it's the 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 cost as I say of getting the data there the the actual hardware side oddly mm-hmm. Because the in while well, you and I can go out and buy the same thing for a fraction of the cost, yeah. if we now have our vendor mm-hmm. supply it, it the, the internal cost is somewhat more. So somebody asking, so many startups and other companies on machine learning and the AML and KYC, how can we choose the appropriate partner? And I think this is really interesting. What are the questions me as a potential buyer uh, should be asking myself uh, for finding the right partner? So I'm looking for a right partner. I'm making a, qu- a list of questions I need to ask myself. What would, what would I write on my list? Dan, let's mm. start with you. Uh, you know, you know it's, it's not enough to just have a cool technology. Mm-hmm. I think you really have to be embedded in the space. Some of our early uh, working in this space was closely with the uh, monitor for H- H- HSBC. Mm-hmm. So this was really a bunch of world-class leading AML experts so look for that helped credible tune partners. that. And, and, you know, having experience to know what to look for mm-hmm. uh, really is the difference between just a cool science project and something that will result in real wins. Mm-hmm. And, and that's very critical in, in this space, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Give me a list, Nick. I would say support. Mm-hmm. Um, because while we can, there's a lot of startups with very interesting technology and it's shiny and, and works fantastic, mm-hmm. very often it needs a lot of, some of it needs, shall I say, people in white coats mm-hmm. tinkering with it now and then. Um, and that's not necessarily what you want. So you might not actually want the bleeding edge of technology, if I can call that. You may want to just go back a bit and use something that is stable, doesn't need quite so many men in white coats with screwdrivers sort of fiddling around in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so support side, to me, mm-hmm. is always really important. And sometimes that you might find that that's available through the larger vendors who themselves collaborate with the smaller vendors. So they take on, if you like, the, 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 the slightly higher risk of this leading edge innovation, but they still provide you with their support infrastructure. So support to me is a really important element mm-hmm. of, of project success. Mm-hmm. Where would I find these, the, you know, the great people? Uh, do you look at what uh, big banks are using? Would what necessarily a big bank is city is is using would work for me if I'm a smaller player? Uh, what's your view on that, Anthony? Uh, no, all banks are different, uh, and especially you know maybe Citigroup and JP Morgan and HSBC. You know we we would be looking at similar things, but you know, each uh, w- one thing I've learned from my uh, time at Citigroup and also looking in t- to, to other banks and compliance and and so on is is each bank is different, and they uh, they have different um, issues and problems, and they have different risk profiles, mm-hmm. uh, and it's it's it's. When I give advice to smaller uh, mm. firms that say to me, "Oh, look, you know, should we should we in, uh, invest in a in, in a all singing or dancing monitoring platform?" Yeah, <clears throat> I say it has to be appropriate to you. If you are a small bank and you are doing, I don't know, thirty uh, cross border wires a month, you don't need a machine. Mm-hmm. Just use a human. Mm-hmm. The best machine that you can have. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of banks out there, especially in the cross border banking world, where they think that they need to produce some sort of fantastic tool to their mm-hmm. clearer mm-hmm. to suggest that they are, you know, cutting edge and all the rest of it. In reality, I would think the problem is, is if you don't also have the, the staff and the human capital that comes with that, you know, for example, in, in some emerging markets, the concept of compliance is still very new. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you go and deploy some sort of fancy, uh, uh, you know, uh, tool against your particular machine and you don't have anyone to run it, Mm-hmm. You're in a problem. So, um, no, very, very, very critical. Do you want to come back on any of those? Well, I think it's uh, the, it is. It's always been difficult for mm. for 
banks to find vendors. Uh, I guess in the in the nineties there was a big movement in machine learning doing things like underwriting. Mm -hmm. So could we improve acutarial process, statistical acutarial processes done since the dawn of statistics? Mm -hmm. Well, nearly. Um, could we use machine learning uh, to improve and reduce write-offs? Mm -hmm. And over a period of time, it took quite a while for that to happen. There were some initial leading, if you like, organizations that took that step. Uh, and over a period of time, it becomes commonplace. Mm -hmm. So we're sort of in this area, in compliance at the beginning of where people doing, say, mortgage underwriting were 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you can, if you look at how they succeeded and the, the, the ones that failed, mm -hmm. um, you can draw some quite uh, strong, which is much of what we're saying, which is, you know, you need to find something relatively small. Mm -hmm. You need to find a vendor that's local, that has support that you can work with. Uh, you need to make sure you can get the data to this application mm -hmm. and then you were talking about KPIs you mm. need to agree a set of KPIs that you measure that project against and I don't think you just switch it on day one mm. it's the again it's the phased piloting approach so you pilot the system mm -hmm. see measure it its performance and then you can start thinking about rolling it out can can multiple machine learning systems coexist so if I start one now for KYC and then I do something else mm -hmm. later whatever that can oh. that can work yeah that's what you do. Absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, I think that's exactly what we're going to see. Is, is a little bit like on on mobile phones. We we have hundreds of thousands of apps we can now download to do just about anything you can yeah. possibly think of. I can see exactly the same within the whole financial sector where we can have apps. Yeah many of them having machine learning. This one's doing underwriting. This one's doing risk assessment. This is doing know your customer. And they're all, mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing is much of the data that each of them need while they use the data differently, mm -hmm. much of it's common. Yes. And so perhaps a task to think about, which is maybe a longer term task, is getting that data. Yeah. And then on top of that data, mm -hmm. finding the apps mm -hmm. to actually provide solutions. I was at a... I, I, yeah, no, I, I think getting back to the tying together the previous point around this being potentially very useful and exposed through utilities, I, I see no reason why not. And, and, and this should not be a competitive space for the banks. This should be a sharing space, both from an altruistic sense, but, but there are data privacy concerns. Uh, for sure, sharing data for a bank A to say, hey, we won't bank with this client. Mm -hmm. You know, they probably don't want that shared with bank B for liability reasons. Mm -hmm. But to have those tools all available through the utility makes, makes perfect sense. And why not have best of breed applications exposed through, through, through these, these types of marketplaces? Absolutely. Okay, so we've got five minutes left, and I want to ask a couple questions because we've got some great ones here. Somebody saying, Google and Amazon, coming back to your apps, uh, provide AI available through uh, those on the internet. Are these a good way to try AI? What's mm. your view? <laughs> the uh, Google and Amazon, bless them, uh, like to uh, <laughs> believe, one, they invented AI, which is <laughs> entirely untrue, uh, and also the terminology. It's somewhat hyped about what it can and can't do. AI is no more or less than a whole bunch of different statistical approaches. And so that's like asking, is, the, is a spreadsheet the, mm. the place to start for mm. being an accountant? Mm. I mean, it might be a very useful tool, and everyone now uses one, but it's not necessarily the right place. Yeah. They're more uh, experimental areas for uh, academics, scientists, data analytic people to, mm. to experiment with. They're not solutions as such. Mm -hmm. So they're very powerful, and they're interesting. Mm -hmm. But again, they only go so far. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the way to, to you, you as an organization need to think, do we want to become experts at AI? Mm -hmm. Do we want a room of people in white coats drifting around? Mm -hmm. Or do we want to stay what we're expert at and look for others externally that can help us build a solution? And I always think of uh, AI is a strange term, actually. I prefer M machine intelligence rather than artificial. But at any rate, it's only a small part of the solution. It might be the enabling bit. But actually, the bit that talks to the humans is probably the most important bit. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't present the information sensibly, if people can't understand the output, 
then it's no good at all. We've seen many projects fail mm. because the output of the, of the machine is not, um, I would say, trusted mm. by people. Mm -hmm. This is another thing. It's called base rate fallacy. If, if the machine, if, you, if your job every day is to come in and interact with this machine, mm -hmm. and, this, and you know, and when you talk in the corridor, you say it's useless. 95% mm. of everything I see every single day is wrong. Mm. So why am I going to trust this machine? Mm. And if you don't have trust, mm. then the, the project will fail. Okay. If people don't trust the output, it will fail. Okay. So. We briefly mentioned regulators, and I want the last question to be about regulators. Do the regulators trust this? Uh, let's, let's start. You work with a lot of financial institutions doing this, so it's obviously yeah, been successful and, and, for Yeah, and I, uh, we actually see differences globally mm -hmm. around the different regulators, how they... The, it's, it's an education process, but most regulators, I believe today, are sympathetic that the costs have risen to the point that, that it's really a burden mm -hmm. on the banks. It should not be the goal of a regulator to put all of the banks out of business, mm. despite what you see on the news every day <laughs> on the front page. Yeah. Right? So, so they, they are sympathetic. They're also looking for win-wins. So when we can come in and show them these auditable reports that have dismissed everything and a reason why, and it's gone deeper than a human normally would, that's a win for them. It's more thorough. It's more accurate. And it's a win for the bank because it's, it's more effective, uh, time efficient and cost effective. Right? So, so under those circumstances, yes, we're seeing a lot of support. Okay. Nick? All I can say on the regulators, I think the regulators are waiting for the banks to tell them what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And I know that seems around the wrong way, but the, the, the <laughs> regulators don't really know. They really don't. They know what they're regulating, but they don't know the, how to automate it. So yeah. they're kind of relying on larger organizations to come back to them with a proposal mm -hmm. to say, look, this is how we're going to do it. This is why it complies with the law. Mm. Uh, and so I actually think it's, it's more two-way with regulators. Anthony, you finding yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. They're absolutely desperate mm. for, for us to actually tell them how we're going to do something. Obviously, we need to explain how we're doing it and, and all the other important pieces to it. But... Um, uh, and I've seen this all the time, is, is the idea that the banks are so stunned waiting for the regulator to tell them what mm. to do or how to implement <laughs> something. And that's not what you want. Mm. You want to you wanna do it yourself. You do not want the regulator telling you how to do it because it's, it, it, you know, it's, no. it's not what you want. No. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I mean... That's it. We closed right on time. Swiss efficiency. Oh. So <laughs> thanks very much for joining us. Thanks to all of you for all of your questions. Don't, remember, don't forget, everybody, yes, remember, don't forget <laughs> that you can rate our sessions and rate our speakers. Just go on to cyrus.com and have a wonderful rest of your morning. We're back here at 10.15 uh, for our next session. So come back, please. It'll be lovely to have you. Thanks a lot.